Hi there, and welcome to the um, first video of content on paleoecology in which we're going to be looking at the ecology of fossils. So I noticed when I was recording the last video um, that I was actually maxing out the um, volume on my inputs. So I apologize if that um, was the case and now I seem slightly quieter. Nevertheless, I hope the, the, the audio is okay. So in this particular video, what we're going to be looking at is what ecology and then what paleoecology actually is. So um, we'll then be moving on to what we can say about individual fossil species and how we can tell this. And then we'll have a quick look at some examples allowing us to understand the ecology of extinct groups of animals. So I hope that'll be pretty cool. I'm looking forward to it. But I, I'm a strong believer that um, in defining terms when we start stuff to make sure that we're all on the same page. So here you can see on this slide some examples um, of a range of groups of fossils uh, or groups of animals, I should say, with a very rich fossil record. How can we use these to understand ecology in the Earth's past? This is a key to defining uh, the question, what is paleoecology? So if we want to define our terms, the uh, definition of ecology is the branch of biology that deals with the relations of organisms to one another and to their physical surroundings. That is a definition of ecology for you thanks to the Oxford English Dictionary. So it's basically looking at interactions as, it mu um, as much as it is the actual biology themselves. Paleoecology is just the application of these principles and these questions to the past. Perhaps a useful way to look at this and make it seem a bit less intimidating, because it's a very broad field, is to split it roughly into two different camps. We can look at the ecology of extinct species. So we can look at the role they play in their ecosystem, their mode of life, and their feeding and their breeding habits. This is a thing called paleoautoecology. I've placed a definition of it on the slide for you here. The study of past populations usually comprising only one or two species. So in short, this is kind of zoomed in paleoecology. But we can also use geological and fossil evidence to reconstruct past biotas as a whole. We can understand um, above populations, whole communities, landscapes, environments, and ecosystems. This we could call, if we wanted to, Paleocynecology, studying these complex interactions between populations of species um, within communities of organisms and within ecosystems as a whole. I've also put a definition of this on the slide for you, and that says paleocynecology is the study of past communities, including all the species comprising them. So basically, this is the zoomed out bit of paleoecology. That's a fairly arbitrary and semantic, I think, division, but nevertheless it's one that helps us divide this up slightly into bite-sized chunks. I think that's necessary because there are a wide number of ways in which you can do paleoecology. It's actually a really interdisciplinary field, drawing on lots of different strands of different sciences. So I hope that's a useful definition and a useful division of this um, science for you. And I wanted to highlight that um, paleoecology becomes increasingly difficult the further back you go. This is both because we have less and less evidence as we get older and older. We have fewer and fewer rocks, um, which will be holding fewer fossil species as we go deep into the geological past, and that can limit what we can say about past ecosystems. But also because the further you go back from today, the increasingly dissimilar those um, ecosystems were. I'm sorry, that was an incredibly poor choice of words, increasingly dissimilar. Uh, basically, the further you go back in time, the more different ecosystems become to today. And what this means is that as we go deeper into the past, uniformitarianism, the idea that things happened in the past as they do today, um, becomes increasingly difficult to apply because the animal communities that were around at those times have a very different makeup to those that are alive today. So I hope that clarifies my poor choice of words there for you. So how can we deduce the ecology of organisms and indeed of individual species? So often when I'm, I'm going to use these two interchangeably because we have one or two fossil exemplars of all of these ancient species. 
Well, paleoautoecology, the branch of ecology that deals with this particular question, broadly looks at, when we're looking at the fossil record, the mode of life of fossil species, their life traits, including breeding and feeding, for example. So this is kind of like the bread and butter of paleoautoecology, what we can actually say about individuals, but also how they fitted into the ecosystem of which they are a part. This is primarily achieved through functional morphology. This is the field in which we deduce the function of the part of an animal from its morphology. So the clue is in its name. It's using the anatomy of extinct creatures to say things about their mode of life. So that's essentially how their morphological form is related to their function. We can combine lots of pointers from different parts of the anatomy of these creatures of um, fossil creatures to get a clearer idea of the mode of life that they, um, they had and therefore how they fitted into their ecosystems. My living example that's shown here is the axolotl, which is shown on this slide in its juvenile form on the left hand side and in its adult form on the right hand side. So this is an amphibious creature um, that is found in a, a few different environments. I often associate them with caves. I'm not sure how exactly how accurate that is. But we can tell just by looking at this fossil, this fossil, <laughs> these aren't fossils. I've got no idea what the fossil record is like for these animals. We can tell by looking at just the shape, the morphology of these creatures in this slide that they live in water. They have these beautiful external gills in both the juvenile and in the adult form. And that tells us that they are breathing underwater. They have a flattened tail for propulsion. This is far better for swimming um, than say a, a conical tail. Um, and so by just looking at that anatomy, we can say something about their mode of life. I wanted to highlight, since we're here talking about axolotls, that they're unusual among amphibians because the adults shown here on the right uh, remain aquatic and gilled mostly um, amphibian adults move out of water and indeed these creatures are weird generally because they are often don't even undergo metamorphosis because their juveniles can breed so often um, these creatures will stay in their juvenile form for their entire life and breed as juveniles rather than metamorphosing into this adult form also, top tip, um, they have a weird swallow reflex, and that means that if you ever keep them as pets, you can keep these in fish tanks, um, if you feed them with uh, food with lots of air, they then start floating because they can't get rid of the, the air in their food, and they float in the water column until they fart where they sink again, which I think is really super cute. So they're really nice creatures in general, but they're my example of functional morphology. All of that works in principle because organisms are adapted to and primarily, re primarily reside in a particular environment. How flexible they are obviously differs across the tree of life and within different groups. So you have things that are generalists and these specialize less to their particular environment than um, specialists do. So generalists versus specialists. We can dig down deeper into that though and say that organisms are not only adapted to their particular environment in the majority of cases, but they're also adapted to a particular lifestyle within an environment. In the example shown on this slide, both of these creatures, the polar bear on the left and the, um, um, I forget, that's not an arctic hare, maybe it is an arctic hare, the rabbit type creature on the right hand side, are both adapted to a lifestyle in Arctic environments, but they play a very different role in the ecosystem with the polar bear being an apex predator and probably eating our creature on the right there. And this reflects the fact that organisms all interact with each other directly or indirectly, and they form an, a community, right? So in many circumstances, when we're then taking uh, relationships such as this, that's the relationships between an organism, a species and its environment, but also the relationships between the different species within an ecosystem, so within a particular environment. Um, uniformitarianism does apply. So this is the idea that we can use 
processes that occur today and relationships that we see in living organisms to infer things um, for fossil ecological communities. So we can make inferences about ancient organisms and environments based on analogies with organisms that are living today. Okay, so let's have a quick example um, of how we apply this to extinct forms. So here's an example of an extinct group. Um, these are the trilobites. You know the trilobites fairly well by now. I'm led to believe you created a pretty awesome phylogeny for the group in your um, cladistics practical just a couple of weeks ago. And this group develops over geological time a range of different morphologies, anatomies, that are associated with different modes of life. So the trilobites, as you're probably aware by this point, were very diverse during the Paleozoic, so from 520-ish million years ago to about 252 million years ago. They were very, very uh, abundant uh, as creatures within these ancient ecosystems. And trilobites are super interesting, not only because they're so diverse, but because they show extensive convergent evolution. What we see when we look at the trilobite fossil record writ large, so from, from a big overview, um, is that the same ecomorphs appear repeatedly in different lineages, reflecting convergent evolution to the same life strategies. So an ecomorph is just this idea that you have these morphologies that are tied with the ecologies of these trilobites. And some examples are shown for you on this slide here. In red, we have our swimmers. These are creatures that had big, what we would call hypertrophied eyes. They have reduced pleurae. Um, you learnt about those when you were doing your characters with Rob. And they appear suited to life in the water column, uh, possibly surface waters. In orange on this slide, we have a, a group called the Elanomorphs. These were smooth uh, in terms of their, their exoskeleton, and they were probably associated with carbonate environments such as reefs. Their body and their pygidium uh, were probably buried in sediment with their head resting on the surface. In blue, we have the Ethyleptic, Ethyloptic, sorry, I should pronounce that correctly, taxa, which have reduced eyes. So eyes were obviously not so useful for them, and this means they were probably um, associated with deep water habitats when there were, where there wasn't much, as much light around. On the far right, we have the elenomorphs, in sh these are shown in green, which had a thin exoskeleton. They could be, a, so this means that we may associate them with life in dysaerobic environments. You don't want to be carrying around a, a heavy exoskeleton that also in, incorporates oxygen in the form of calcium carbonate into the exoskeleton when there's not a lot of oxygen around. So this is an example amongst different groups of morphological convergence with an adaptive significance. And it's very much a thing that you can build up from the first principles. It's not particularly rocket science. We look at these um, fossil morphologies, we try and understand how they differ from each other, and then we draw inferences from that. So that's an example of paleoautoecology. But even with extinct forms, when we can make these sensible deductions, there are limits to what we can say when we're looking at the fossil record. There are changes that occur within these groups that we can't explain so easily using ecology. An example that I've chosen here is the spined trilobites that start appearing in the fossil record in the Devonian. Clearly there are other selective forces occurring within the group that are not directly related to their ecology. So these spines may be some form of um, sexually selected characteristic, but they could also be defensive in their nature. And so we have to take a nuanced approach to trying to understand the paleoecology of fossil species. I wanted to finish with a really cool example of paleoautoecology, applying this to a um, completely uh, extinct group of animals. So you may remember from uh, lecture number one, the one on evolutionary milestones, the Ediacaran fauna. So these were those weird creatures that appear at 650 million years ago. Um, they're multicellular organisms. They go extinct before the appearance of major 
um, animal phyla at 542 million years ago or shortly thereafter. And we have absolutely no idea what their mode of life was. In fact, we um, discussed some possibilities in our first Zoom session. But I, uh, my example here is based on some work from some very talented colleagues of mine, uh, led by Emily Mitchell, that were published in 2015. Um, and these are using some clever statistical techniques to, de to deduce elements of the mode of life of an Ediacaran species. So specifically, in this paper, they looked at how these organisms may have bred. It's really clever, because what they do is they use spatial analysis to investigate the distribution of a single species called Fractifusus on bedding planes. So on uh, bedding planes, um, so a single surface of rock, you actually have fossils of a large number of individuals of this species in their life position. This allows you to investigate how um, they are distributed in space. This graph here shows that, so this is a thing called a pair correlation function, um, showing the distances between each individual on this bedding plane. It's essentially how they're distributed in space for different size brackets of these organisms, where below zero is, um, is uh, over dis more dispersed than one might expect, and above one is aggregated, so clustered together. And this showed that these creatures, as you can see, were in some size brackets significantly clustered together. This allows us to say that these um, organisms were probably sessile, they didn't move around, they are, were benthics, they lived on the seafloor, and they lived their lives in aggregated communities. They're closer to each other than you would expect by chance. If they'd just, for example, come in as juveniles and just split, spread randomly, that's not what we see. What we see is they cluster together, uh, or they aggregate, I should suppose I should say. This hierarchical clustering on bedding planes uh, suggests that the organism was producing asexually, and the patterns that we see in the size distribution here suggest that this was done via lateral extensions. So what this means is that there were juveniles that were attached to the parents, and that you have a number of different size hierarchies in which this happens. That uses the spatial analysis to actually paint a picture of something really specific about how these organisms reproduced. And for that reason, I think it's a really cool and really exciting study. So that is one really nice example of paleoautoecology and what we can say about fossil organisms where we don't even really understand their mode of life because they are so alien to us now. And with that, that brings me to the end of video number one, and I will see you shortly for video number two.